For flat pedal riders after the most grip possible, 510 has really been the only option. Year after year of new shoe releases has left us the question, why is it so hard for others to achieve similar grip? With the release of their new 2FO D8 shoes and now the Rhyme, I wanted to know more about the specialised shoe development process. Did they want all the grip, and if so, why did it take so long? How did they test the sole for grip? And what about their choice of materials? Specialised footwear product manager Stephen Kay was happy to dive into the new shoes, answering my questions and more. We discussed the development process behind Slipknot ST, the materials used in the uppers, and specialised body geometry. It turns out heaps goes into making new shoes, and the type of rubber needed for grip is tricky to develop. I'm AJ Barlas, and this is my conversation with Specialised Stephen Kay. Uh, do we want to just jump straight into the questions that I've got here? Sure. Yeah, I don't know. I can. I'm also happy. I can start with just like a, like a little bit of overview of the the whole thing. So I think 2FO is is um, you know I think the one that uh, uh, you're seeing a lot more products come out from us. We have a lot of different sort of variations on that product, um, and that's the, the whole 2FO family. We really want that shoe to to be part of this. Uh, what I kind of call like the coastal experience of trail. So it's trail riding that is influenced by surf culture that's pulling from skate culture. It's creating its own experience of this is what trail looks like. Um, but it's a lot about, yeah, it's a lot about like this certain look and this certain mindset you bring to trail riding. That's like about having a friggin' really good time. Right. It's about like, uh, okay. riding cool features. It's about sessioning things. It's about, uh, getting airtime, things like that are really like at the forefront of that rider's mindset. Um, so, and it's more casual rather than sort of technical race focus. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's it. Exactly. Okay. Like very, you know, I think when we were designing this generation of two FOs, we were reacting to some feedback from our previous generation, which is more technical, like more overtly technical. And a lot of riders are like, Hey, like your shoes work great, but I feel like I can't wear them because I show up and I feel like I have to do something really special <laughs> because of like the look, like I, I, I feel like it marks me as like, Oh, they have the thing and they, they better do something really cool or else. And like riders just wanted to like be kind of living their lives and like, Oh yeah, we're going to ride some sick trail at the same time. Right. Um, so that's that's really kind of like where where 2FO is positioning really like yeah that, that, within those those cultures those sort of expressions of, of riding rhyme on the other hand is the shoe we're we're looking more at uh riders who are using their bikes as a tool for outdoor exploration um so okay. uh sort of the the other experiences were that are that are sort of flowing over into trail riding are things like uh, mountaineering, uh, backpacking, fell running, alpine running, um, and and the bike as an, as a component of that as well. Um, right. So riders taking their bikes and they want to see how far they can go, what they can explore, what they can do that they weren't able to do before. Okay. And they come to riding with a lot a big mindset of like, I need this capability because i'm going into the unknown i'm going into something that is uncomfortable and i need to know that my gear is gonna is gonna let me let me do that it's gonna it's gonna stand up to the task okay so there we have a a much more technical uh expression of the products like overtly technical and subvertly technical we're 2fo we're we're like overtly casual subvertly technical we hide it it's in there but we're we're trying to conceal it within the product Rhyme, we let it, we let it shine. Um, and then the other big component that makes Rhyme really special is the the hiking aspect. Those riders, they really want, wanted that ability to hike, uh, because the trail is not always well-defined. It's not, it's not maintained. It's not, it's friggin' sometimes it's goat path. Sometimes it's, you know, uh, it's, the, it's really rough. It's overgrown. And they wanted that, like, I'm not always on a bike. I need my shoes to work really well off bike too. So. Right. So with the DHs, it's interesting what you say about about the the sort of desire to move away from the super technical sort of side, because um, I still find 
they're casual looking, but there's definitely material wise, there's some similarities between them and the original two FOs even, um, which I still have a pair sitting around out here. Uh, what key elements change to get that more casual, casual look? Like did much of the materials change and you minimized sort of some of the technical shape of the shoe maybe or something like that? Yeah, I think for upper, the upper materials in particular, um, we, we've we moved a lot of things in more internally and then given the surface finishes a lot more of what you might see in a casual product. So like um, on uh, on the flat shoe in particular, there's a, there's, there's definitely a, a lot of kind of casual vibe with uh, we're bringing in like a full grain leather into the vamp. Um, and then uh, it's a lot of like textiles. Um, so we're bringing in textile quarters, uh, textile lining, um, things that would maybe be more in, in a, you'd see in, in, yeah, in, in like a Vans or something, something that you would wear more casually. Uh, the DH is an interesting product too, because we, we have kept as much technical execution because of the performance requirements of that product. We've kept them as high as possible or kept them equally high, I would say, but we've started to conceal them better. So like gen one to FO, the quarter construction, like sort of like from the sides of the shoe back through the heel and then the new shoe are actually very similar in terms right. of, uh, materials. Um, we're, we've added an additional internal reinforcement to the new shoe um, to sp specifically like get more hold of the foot, especially for like when you're trying to use your feet to throw your bike around a little bit, like when things are really rough and you got to like really push into it. Um, we we want to create even more hold than what we had with the original shoe. The forefoot though is on the, on the first shoe, we had what's called a poured PU vamp. It's a, it was like a rubbery finish. Um, yep. and it just had this very hard technical feel that wasn't that comfortable. Um, on the second generation of 2FO, we had a, a captured foam. So it was, a, a mesh with a foam with a TPU is all welded is this, this really like, you know, modern Marvel of engineering style of, of approach. Um, and with the new shoe in the, in that toe area, we wanted, uh, protection and comfort were our two keys. So we had, uh, with keeping that, that casual aesthetic. So we have a, a, a natural, um, or synthetic material over the, the vamp of the shoe, both looking like a, a like a leather detail. And then, mm -hmm. uh, the inside is lined with, that's where the secret sauce is. There's a hydrophobic air mesh in there creating cushioning. Um, yeah. and so the really nice thing is we get like the vamp, it creases way better. There's way less hot spots. Um, and so hiking's way better. Um, and we still have that same low level of cushioning and protection that we've had in the old shoes, just, just much more comfortable and wearable execution. Right. Yeah. There's definitely the, the mesh you speak about too. The original two FO, I remember being, uh, one of the main selling features was quick drying and lightweight. And a lot of that was those materials. But as you mentioned that there's still some of that mesh mesh in this new shoe. I, I noticed it particularly through, I would say, I guess, the middle section mm -hmm. if you run from the heel down to the toe does mm -hmm. that sound right yeah does that help with breathability and stuff like that as well or yeah absolutely yeah so that's the the that expel mesh and the way that we construct our shoes we um we we've been doing um yeah we've been after that since since that gen first generation of 2fo um and uh yeah i think we we knew it was really cool when we first came out with it. Like it was like a cool feature. Um, so yeah, maybe a backstory on that is like the traditional way of, of uh, constructing the shoe is um, to put a lot of foam lining in it. Um, so like, if you think back to like, Oh, uh, like especially skate shoes from like the nineties, uh, like yeah. that was basically like, you could just take your kitchen sink sponge and like, you're just the in, in <laughs> shoes. Um, to create cushioning to like protect protect the foot and you saw that happening a lot in trail shoes the foams come down we, it's it's getting used less than it was in the late 90s thank god um yeah but um most most people are still using a traditional foam to create that and so it does exactly that it acts like a sponge it absorbs water 
Uh, and it doesn't breathe super well unless you perforate it. The, there's, even though it's open, it's not open enough to let air move all the way through it. Um, it, it, right. has, it, it gets stuck. Um, so with the Expel Mesh, what we're doing is it's, a, it's an air mesh um, that has the, has the structure in the loft to give the cushioning and to give the shoe shape. And, and um, then beyond that, it's so open that uh, it, it lets air pass straight through it. So the breathability is incredible. We just have to perforate the outside material to let the air into the shoe. Right. And then um, it won't hold on the water. It's all hydrophobic. And so open that the water just pours out. And um, yeah, we, we replace per as much as we can uh, on the inside of it, like as much lining and foam inside the shoe as we can with that stuff to, to really, to really have a big effect. So yeah, we're like, usually of all the shoes I've tested, we're, we're, we're the lightest when it comes to water onboarding. I, I, I did this huge dunk tank test with a bunch of, a bunch of shoes and competitor shoes, like just dunking them, letting them sit in water and soak and then drying them at two hour intervals, seeing how, how rapidly the air was coming out of the moisture was coming out of the shoes. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty incredible. Some shoes are, are more than doubling or just about doubling in weight <laughs> when you, when you, when you get them wet. Um, and then they'll take, uh, days to dry, you know, like, especially, uh, our riders in the UK who helped us start on that original expel mesh stuff was they were like, uh, basically August rolls around or August or September rolls around. My shoes get wet and they're wet until June the next. Like, <laughs> they just never have that. They don't use boot dryers in the UK, yeah. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> She'd be like, this isn't my problem. They make boot dryers for a reason. You can just get that. Well, we have similar problems here for sure. Like once the wet season hits, you're, you're drying your shoes every day. Or you got to have a couple of pairs to help you. Either way, sometimes they're not dry even on the boot by the <laughs> next day, um, depending on the shoe and the situation. But yeah, that's still obviously a uh, a key point for your shoes is to is to not only keep the weight down and and uh, allow airflow, but is to to help with water and and allow them to dry a bit quicker as well. Yeah. yeah. So with the DHs, the the rubber in the sole I notice is considerably stickier than all the previous two FOs I've ridden in. Um, how did Specialize achieve this? And and I guess another question to add to that is, uh, were you seeking that all along? And if so, why did it take so long? <laughs> yeah, I think, okay, we can, I, I'll try not to go too into the weeds, but if you want to go into the weeds, we can, I'll, I'll, I'll I'll give you as much as you want. <laughs> okay, let's do it. Um, but uh, yeah, we we absolutely have been after like having. Ha we want to be the the leader in sticky rubber. We want we will always wanted to be there. That's like pedal grip for flat flat pedal riders for us has been like the objective since I started working here. Like since before that, really, it was right. like. So we we we've always been trying to figure it out, and I think. Um, we've tried a different, a couple of different avenues, um, to make that happen. So, um, I think maybe I'll start with the previous generation of 2FO cause, cause I think that's really where we, we started doing a lot of really in-depth work about trying to understand exactly what's happening at that pedal interface. So, okay. um, when we started working on that shoe and that new compound, this, the Slipknot 2.0 compound, um, the we really kicked that off with going to a bunch of riders uh probably the the most notable and who the folks who helped us the most were the coast gravity guys um and just talking to them about like what is happening where do you feel this disconnect occurring where 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 are you you know bouncing off the pedals what, what are the inputs um we also did this really cool study with them where we um uh, poor, poor Dylan. I, we made him put this like pressure mapping system on and then sent him down the same trail. Like, I don't know, maybe 20 times, like the same <laughs> section of trail, which just represented a bunch of different, uh, scenarios of, of trail that we wanted to, to test against. And we were just like changing shoes and frigging back up to the top, new pair of shoes back up. Right. And it just had everything. It had like big jumps, small jumps, big bumps, small bumps, fast bumps, 
like all these things where it's like um, that disconnect is happening. Okay. And so we had all these compounds, we had all this different stuff. And what we were really focusing on was how do we get the pins into the shoe? That's like, that was like number one. And so we had like, we're like, ah, oh, we got to make the rubber soft. We have to make the foam soft. We got to make everything all soft so we can get the pins in the shoe because you can't have grip unless the pins are biting the shoe. Right. And uh, we, I think we, we made some nice improvements. We definitely, it was, it was better than the first gen. Um, and it, it was, as you say, it was soft for sure. Okay. That sole was noticeably soft. <laughs> I like that you're like, it was, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Which, so we saw with the way we were testing, we were the pressure system. We were testing like how quickly is, uh, how quickly is Dylan becoming unweighted? How quickly is he coming off the pedal? And how often is he coming off the pedal? Mm-hmm. And then started benchmarking and like, okay, he's off the pedal 15% more in this than in this, right? And started making selections that way. Um, we did a lot of work then too about uh, lug design, mm-hmm. the 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 depth, the net net thickness, the spacing between the lugs, allowing for the pins to slot in. Yeah. Um, so that way, even when you're un- unweighted, the pins can kind of pinball their, their in there and just grab something. Yeah. Uh, the feedback that we got is exactly what you're saying. My God, you made it soft. <laughs> <laughs> and I like the best, the best word I ever heard someone say was marshmallowy. They yeah. Like, that's, pretty <laughs> that's pretty accurate. That's pretty accurate. Awesome. Yeah. So it was good. It was, we made improvements. It was a great learning experience. Uh, I really, I think it really set us up for some conversations for this new compound. And so with the new compound, we were reacting to the softness comments. Like one of the things I still remembered, uh, I think it was Curtis who said it, who was like, there's nothing, there's no shoulder. There's nothing to push against. So like the bikes leaned over, you're trying to throw it back up to like get yourself, get the bike ride it again. And he's like, and I just roll and I get rolling right off this thing. Right. Um, so we wanted to give the, the, the realization we really had was we needed a very stable platform for riders to feel connected. We, we lost the connection in our effort to create grip. And then we lost the true grip too at the, you know, you could, you had low level grip, but when you really pushed it, it wasn't there anymore. Right. Um, so we went back to uh, essentially compounding was was phase one for the new comp, the new rubber. So we we con- consulted with our rubber team first firstly, and then they also helped connect us with some additional outside compounders. So we had some some rubber chemists come in. Wow. And we had a really clear picture at that point of like what we wanted the rubber to be and how we wanted to create connections. So our main objectives were around uh, still still maintaining pin penetration. But we wanted the pin to penetrate the rubber, not the foam, which is what we had originally. That if you if you took a pen in the old shoe and you pushed into the into the sole, you'd see this huge area of deformation. This huge like it would make like a crater, yeah. and the rubber didn't do anything, and the foam just like absorbed the whole thing. Yeah. So we knew we wanted the rubber to be the thing that grabbed the pin. Then once the pin's in the rubber, we wanted it to be really strong so it couldn't move around. So you. Yeah, it was like you could really push into it. And then uh, the final thing, which uh, was the most difficult bit, I would say, is um, the re- it's, it's called a rebound resilience. Um, and if you think about like the purpose of rubber is to be bouncy, like that's why you make tires out of it, and it's efficient mm-hmm. because it it wants to return, it wants to it wants to deform, and then it wants to return to its natural shape, right. the shape you you've cured it in. Um, and so it's returning that there's energy return that happens and like tire. That's awesome. But when you're like bouncing down a trail, it's just bouncing you off the pedal. Right. Yeah. Um, and so that was the, the rebound resilience was the, the, the key for us in this, in the way we are, we are unlocking grit was making a rubber that's effectively dead. Okay um and bounceless uh and that's why we ended up that's why it took us so long to (laughs) to do this and and why we um 
why it was why it was so hard to accomplish is there 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 aren't many people who know how to make that type of rubber. Okay. Because it's so weird. Like most of the time, people are going to go to they're going to go to outdoor rubber chemists who are making like really durable, like single tractiony style rubber. Yeah. Um, or they're going to go to tire manufacturers who are making very resilient, uh, sort of efficient rubbers. And then what we needed was someone who wanted none of those things <laughs> yeah. who cared, you know? And, uh, yeah, I think that's that rebounding because the low rebound was huge. Yeah. It's essentially the whole thing. What, 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 Oh, the final thing we did was we made the, we made some of the parts firmer. So we went, we totally flipped on ourselves. We decided soft, soft rubber is actually not that good because it's not strong. It can't, it can't, it gives you that marshmallow squidgy yeah. thing and soft foam behind it wasn't good either because the foam deforms first and the rubber just moves into that, into the void that the squishing foam left. Right. Um, Which is where you lose so, that response. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So firm it up, have the rubber, I guess, not compress as much. Like, how does that, how did that work? Like you, the concept of slowing the rebound makes sense, but how does the pin still comfortably go into that rubber to begin with? I'm trying to think of, I'm, I wish I had a good visualization for this. <laughs> <laughs> So I think it has to do, it has to do a little bit with, um, uh, it's called, um, it's a little bit of tensile strength. It's a little bit of elongation percent and the, and the durometer has a lot to do with it as well. So like our old rubber, we, right. If we were like, so, so focused on getting the pin in. So we made a soft foam and a soft rubber and the rubber had a, a very high elongation percent and low tensile strength. So it didn't, you could pull it. Like if you could, if you think about like, um, like an elastic band almost. Yeah, exactly. Just like, an, like so easy to stretch. Right. But you can stretch it around anything. And that was our idea of like, okay, we can stretch it or, you know, you can stretch it around any shape. You can get it around the pin. You can get, get the pin in. And what we ended up with was like the foam. So like there's the pin loading. And the foam goes like the foam's inside and it just goes like, and then the rubber, since it's so stretchy, it's just like a, I should do it with a book. It's just like a sheet. And then the rubber just goes like. It just molds to that surface. Yeah. yeah. And so you get this, but not tightly. It didn't, right. it was like huge over this broad area. And so, so we increased the, the hardness of the foam. Uh, was the first thing. So it just doesn't want to compress quite as much. And that that instead makes the pin push more on the rubber because the foam can't get out of the way. So right. we've captured the rubber between the hard surface of the pin and the relatively soft but firmer surface of the foam. Okay. And then inside is the rubber. So what we what we did, what we achieved by doing that was say we told the rubber it has to do more. And then uh, the rubber has a, a lower elongation and a higher tensile strength. So it doesn't have that same, like you can't stretch it the same. It's pretty, it's more like, um, uh, like Laffy Taffy. Laffy Taffy. I'm not familiar with that. Oh, like, uh, <laughs> it's a, like a good candy, like, uh, Oh, like a toffee or something. Yeah. It's like an old airhead. Right. You know, that's kind of, you got it at Halloween and then you didn't eat it for like a year because <laughs> it was like sour apple flavor and I don't know, it got all hard. You know, that yeah. it doesn't, it has sort of the same thing. Like you don't, it can't really stretch. And then uh, it's, it's also when you, yeah, when you try and push into it, it just barely wants to move out of the way. Interesting. And so it's like, the pin, like when you load it with the pin, like the weight of the weight of the rider on the pin is, is way is totally sufficient to get the pin all the way pushed in. Mm -hmm. But now it's like the area of deformation has sh shrunk by more than half. Um, you get full penetration and then it like it once it's, it's in there and now there's so much tensile strength in the rubber, it can't move around. It's like not squidging. It's just like friggin'. And then you add the slow rebound and it's just not bouncing or anything like that. Yeah. Interesting. 
So is it from a tensile strength um, and elongation sort of point of view, is it more similar to the initial 2FO? Uh, in terms of durometer, it's more similar to the original one. I think that okay. the, um, so I wasn't involved with the development of the original one, but it, there were some concepts there that we threw out for Gen 2 that we returned to. Um, All right especially the concept of asking the rubber to do the work yeah, um, was a big thing of that first generation of like, it, it should be semi hard. It should have a hard material behind it to really make sure that the pins purchase on the rubber rather than sit somewhere between the foam, you know, like it's somewhere in there. It was like, no, no, we really want to refocus on the, on the rubber. So that's really the only thing though. It's, it's, it's a totally different compound otherwise uh, yeah. other than other than oh it feels it for sure on the bike like cool. it's night and day different yes. um cool. i wish i had the the model in between that you're referring to with the softer sole still because i still have the original and now i have these and but i'm missing that one but i spent so much time in that one just wearing it around i, I still remember it um but it is interesting how it's changed so the 2FO DH, the new shoe is a flat pedal, but there's also a downhill clip version. Mm -hmm. um, how does the sole on the DH clip version differ to the flat? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I think maybe I should say really quickly too before before I jump jump into the, the details. One of the other uh, sort of line concepts that we're really changing is we used to have like a good, better, best story within 2FO. I didn't really say this earlier, but we used to have good, better, best is how we built it. It was really like good and better, right? We have like 1.0 and 2.0 and they 1.0 was like a distillation of the 2.0. Okay. And with DH and Roost, we're gonna we're going away from that entirely and we're just doing bests is our, our approach now. Like Roost, that's the best shoe for riding trail in. DH, like general all around do it. Yeah, that's a bit more casual again. Yeah. Uh, DH, best for when you want to go really fast over really sketchy shit. Um, so that's kind of our new approach. And then the, the reason I brought this up was for the pedal interface. The big like thing that the light switch that we, we turned on and we're trying to get after is there are people, riders who want that expression, best general trail riding shoe in both pedal interfaces. And so that's a big thing for us too, is like, we want to give riders all those options. Cool. Uh, sorry for the aside. No, that's good. <laughs> that's good to know. Um, the differences in the, the soles, um, it's, it is quite a lot actually. Um, so in, on the DH, we put it on the flat shoe. It's the, the new rubber compound. It's a full foam. It's like toe to heel foam piece, uh, foam midsole. And then in the midsole, we also have a stiffener, a shank uh, that okay. is not in the roost. Uh, it's only in the DH. And okay. uh, we're just trying to prevent the, sh the, the shoe from totally collapsing over the pedal on those like really big hits, like uh, like for an extended run too. You know, if you're doing like a, like a 10, 15 minute descent where like you might start to feel that fatigue plus descent, you might start to feel that fatigue. Yeah, um, okay. So trying to counteract that with a, an extra stiffener. So that's the flat construction. <clears throat> the clip construction is a lot more um, similar to what we've done in the past from our, in our other clip shoes. So the probably the, at the core of it is a, the, our lollipop shank. Um, so it's a three quarter injection nylon shank that gives us the, the, the mounting point for the T-nut and it, it's shortened so that the heel and toe can break away so you can like hike. It's comfortable to walk in, yeah. Then that's in a, uh, pressed into an, a foam midsole. And then the rubber compound on the outsole is um, actually our, our current slip knot clipless rubber. So we have a few different rubber objectives with that with that rubber that aren't about like pedal grip there yeah. we, we prioritize other other aspects for that off bike traction is huge for that rubber and then uh the 
uh, like uh, abrasion durability is another really big one for us. So like when you're in and out. Yeah, yeah. exactly. That like that ability for it to slide over something that's kind of toothy and not just kind of disintegrate mm-hmm. um, is, is a, uh, yeah. So, so it, need, it needs to be, I guess, firmer and faster rebounding. And I guess you don't need to worry about those as much because you're attaching yourself to the interface mechanically. Yeah, you, we don't need to create pedal grip. We need to create longevity. We need to create traction, right? Traction versus grip was kind of a big thing for that. So it's much more aligned with what you'd see from uh, outdoor rubber. But the key thing for people who are listening is that the the rubber on the clip shoe is different for a different purpose than the flat pedal shoe, which is now really quite grippy. Yeah. So uh, we'll move into body geometry. Um, the body geometry stuff that Specialized has been doing for years has been a pretty big part and it's kind of brought through over that time, particularly in the shoes in my experience, some pretty interesting um, feeling and support and all that sort of stuff. Uh, the DH shoe has the bonded geometry label on it, but I'm interested in what elements of that technology and design has been, has been implemented and focused on in that shoe. As an example, the footbed doesn't have a body geometry footbed in it of the shoe. Yeah. So, so, um, yeah, we definitely, we believe wholeheartedly in body geometry and, and what it can do at the foot connection for, for riders, right? I think it's all about like, we just want to make this incredible touch point that supports the rider's physiology. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, so we, um, you know, we've been asked cause body geometry historically has been so focused on pedaling efficiency. And I think a lot of trail riders look at that and they're like, this doesn't apply to me. Like, this right. Isn't yeah. I don't care. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which I think is, a, uh, is absolutely valid. Uh, yeah. and, and something that really also caused us to pause and, and reassess, like, what does body geometry mean in, in downhill riding? Um, and so I think that, um, what we, what we were really looking at was, um, what does, what does body geometry do that uh, something without body geometry cannot do? Right. If we think about body geometry, it's a few things in footwear. So it's a four foot varus wedge. So we, we tilt to the four foot very slightly. It's 1.5 millimeters on the, on the inside, on the medial side uh, mm-hmm. of angulation in comparison to the heel and in comparison to the ground plane. So the heel is aligned with the ground plane. Okay. Uh, then it's also a longitudinal, what we call longitudinal arch support, which is the, the arch across your foot. Um, and, uh, the way that we do that is pretty special. We build it into the midsole and we support, support it through the footbed. So, um, there's two components to creating that arch support. Um, and then finally it's the metatarsal button, which is the little bump in the midsole or sorry, in the insole that helps kind of open your feet. So we kind of looked at those, those are the core body geometry features of shoes. Um, in trail riding, we found, uh, and, and in, in, in this case, especially descending, we actually found that those aspects still play a pretty key role in creating good connection between the rider and the pedal. So, um, the, the first two, the, the four foot wedge and the longitudinal arch, they're both there to mitigate collapse. And I think when we've thought about that collapse in the past, we're thinking about like pedaling and then as you start to apply pressure, you're like, your knee is diving in and right. We're, we're just trying to prop the foot up by preventing arch collapse, preventing forefoot collapse and keeping everything aligned. Right. And what we started seeing was the lows that happen on descending. That's also causing collapse. That's also causing like your knees to come in. It's causing your body to sort of activate your, um, your abductors to keep your knees out. So it's, it's, it's creating more muscle fatigue and more muscle recruitment to keep the, keep the knees in position, um, even as you descend. And so, um, we really think that the both, both arch support and forefoot support have a role to play in descending in creating a very, uh, harmonious, stabilized structure for the rider to be pressing against. Okay. So, uh, 
that's yeah that is that's that's sort of those components the final one the met the met button um and what that's there to do is like it pushes up on the on the met heads just behind them it's kind of yeah. in this part of your foot and then usually you put your foot in a cycling shoe and you tighten it and it like clamps it and crushes everything and so that met button's there to help push everything open um and keep that data flow out to your toes so i think trail riders too a lot of them are riding with like less closure tension not all but many yeah. of them it's a lot more like casual like uh lacing. just slip them on yeah like oh yeah like but like don't even untie them just freaking get your shoot your foot in there and um and uh the the so i think there's a little bit less of a need there probably but okay. um for those riders especially the downhill riders i i think it's still so critical like those we made those shoes so you could friggin wrench on them and just like have the most secure hold possible um and so that met button is there to to help split to help splay it open um and keep the data flow and blood flow out to your toes so yeah it, it is a special footbed we're doing like we we we're making um we're using a special foam um it does it is our body it's our it's our red which is our low arch oh okay support um so it's it does have a it has a meta, metatarsal button and then it has the it it is still have that sort of longitudinal arch we sh we do ship although most riders need a blue uh which is our mid height um, okay it does ship with the red because we wanted the shoe to be usable by everyone out of the out of the box it is the low arch just so like no one's going to put the shoe on and be like there's not there's too much arch support yeah but this feels too sci-fi and techy i'm not interested <laughs> <laughs> yeah but yeah, it's it's still we, we want to make sure like I think with the um, with a lot of with a lot of casual shoes, you'll see a really simple footbed go into those. They're, it's like a die cut sheet sheet material. Yeah. Um, we knew we needed something that was molded, that was shaped to the shoe, shaped to the foot, um, and gave that really kind of next level of support. Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah, it's it's all all that text in there. We just it's hidden. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's definitely hidden. It, it wasn't as uh, I mean that's why I asked the question. It wasn't as uh, as uh, obvious as it is with other shoes. Uh, you mentioned the other footbed, the blue. Is there a third one as well? Yeah, we make three. There's a, a red, red, blue, green. We have a lot of ways to talk about it. Red, red, and blue and green. So red's pretty mellow. Blue, you feel is what the majority of the population is for foot. Yeah. And then I guess the, the green is a high arch. Yep, exactly. Okay. What does someone do if they're, if someone is, they know they're of a high arch and they want to buy these shoes, can they just say to their local bike store, I, I need the green footbed. Can they just put that in there or how does that work for people purchasing these shoes? Yeah, they, we do. You mean like, is it like an upgrade? Like, uh, you're yeah. like, just take that like, out. Do they have to pay extra or do they just swap it out? Or <laughs> No, it is, a, it is a separate buy at this point. We actually, we have talked a little bit about how we could do that um, and, and kind of have like a, yeah, you know, like it kind of, it crosses actually into a lot of uh, like that semi-custom experience. I think a lot of riders are starting to look for and like you hit the nail on the head, right? Like I have super narrow sit bones. I've, I, I have no use for a 143 saddle, right? Like, or a 155, right? I can ride a few 143s, um, but uh, uh, yeah, it's right. It's like, or like uh, the the saddle customization of like, oh, I don't really, I don't want to be numb. I'd like a power. Um, yeah, we've been trying to figure out like if, if and how we could execute on something like that. I think if we're still working towards that experience. We really want to give right like. We'd love to do things like reduce the waste of a scrap footbed, um, mm -hmm. add the value of, of a, you know, that experience of the rider being able to have something that kind of comes to them that's, that's already kind of customized for them. Um, we're still working towards it, though. Right now, what we, are, what we have is um, that the, the footbed that comes in the shoe is, is, our, is our pretty basic. It's a single style of foam, so it's, it's just a molded EVA piece. In the case of 2FODH, there's uh, it's a special foam that has more spots for uh, water to get pulled away. So it's like an ex 
an expel experience of a footbed. Yeah. Um, and then uh, for the aftermarket footbed, like let's say you're a high arch, I actually I appreciate the improved experience, even of the even though the the stock shoe comes with red, the BGSL footbed in red is a is a really great experience as well. So that's sort of where we're at right now. You buy the footbed as a separate piece, um, and then and then slide it. You know, just to replace the ones that are in your shoe. Okay, cool. I think we're pretty good with that one. Okay. The rhyme. One thing I noticed with the rhyme, and I may be completely wrong. I haven't measured anything. I've been scratching my head trying to work out how to measure it. Is the sole felt taller to me than? the 2FO flat and the impact pro that I was coming out of before the rhyme. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about life about that? Is that, is it an accurate sort of finding that I had or, and if so, why? One of the things we really defined in these shoes was uh, like in the, in the mindset of creating pedal grip was the, was the stack height of everything. So we need like, this much lug, this much net rubber, this much foam to create that, create that grip. Okay. Um, I, I think you are feeling a different stack height difference. I'm trying to figure out what might contribute to that. Okay. I'd have to try them on one on each foot. I haven't done that yet, but I feel like the height difference was more prominent from sort of the midsection back to the heel. Yeah. Almost like it had more of a heel lift, like an athletic shoe would. Yeah. Cool. I think I, that's, that's where my head's going. I think that's what you're feeling is like it's in the pedaling area. It's going to be very minor, but standing, you'll you'll feel it a little bit more because of the yeah, yeah the the last orientation when we when we draw the outsole um, exactly. So going for more of like um, that hiker orientation with um, I can't. I'm sorry, I can't remember the exact millimeter off the top of my head. If it's like oh, that's a, all right, uh, it might be around a 10 millimeter drop. Where two uh, fo we give it we've we try and flatten it out and give it less of that like aggressive pitched over feel it should have more of a like a when you're standing it should have more of a, mm-hmm. like barefoot feel kind of or a van skate shoe or whatever yeah so okay. I'm really impressed you can feel that most people can't don't they feel it but they don't know they're feeling it uh, is there anything else different about rhyme construction wise to the dh flat actually. Those the probably the last thing to call out about rhyme. So like we talked a lot about the the technical aspect of rhyme. It's it's a fully welded shoe, um, and we did that to really get rid of like any any sort of like seams and stuff that that you know might cause some discomfort on the shoe. It makes it look a lot like really technical, which is um, we knew that shoe could take that. Um, that right. that rider was looking for that experience as well. Um, yeah, there's no. There are no seams on this. Oh, there's one at the back. One at the back, yeah, just to sew it up. Wow. So um, the really interesting thing on Rhyme is that we did include the same internal shank that we include on on DH flat. So Roos flat is just the shoe, the shoe, when the shoe comes to the outsole, it's just foam and rubber. Uh, Mm -hmm. DH flat has that internal stiffener to absorb big impacts. In Rhyme Flat, we included that same internal shank, the little internal stiffener that's part of the EVA, but for a different reason than we did on DH. So on DH, pedal interface, it's absorbing huge impacts. In Rhyme, what it's doing for that rider is um, adding torsional stiffness. So like that ability to like twist the shoe. Um, And so I think like the the big reason for doing that in Rhyme was for that hiking experience. Right especially when you're hiking something that is unrideable, usually that means it's pretty rough. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and riders were really looking for that ability to like use their feet to, to really jam it into the, into the dirt. So like, if you think about like uh, crossing something that's super loose and like, you're like bench cutting your way every step. Um, we were really, we put that shank in there to give them that ability to like kick into the dirt, get some traction and then, um, hike, hike over whatever friggin' non-developed go path they're on. Um, right. and a lot of times with their bike on their back, which is a, you know, uh, so you need uh, that added stability. Exactly. 
I guess that that continues to the edges of the shoe too, like looking at them in hand, particularly the outside of each. The the rhyme, the lugs are more aggressive right to the edge. Mm-hmm. They're kind of a sharper edge there just to give that support. Mm-hmm. Yeah, with, uh, with rhyme, exactly. It's get the bite everywhere you can. Um, and then with, uh, with 2FO, it was a lot about um, going back to that like harmonious level between aesthetic functionality and like kind of, you know, like it, it looks so outdoorsy to have, to have outsole lugs on something poking, poking yeah. you know, like the toothy look. You're like, wow, that looks yeah. pretty outdoors. It's crazy what you can do to a 2FO silhouette, silhouette just by putting a toothy outsole on it. It suddenly right. doesn't look that cool anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, one last question. The guys were confused that I had a rhyme flat pedal shoe. I guess there used to be a rhyme clip shoe in the range. Is that gone now or? No, we, so rhyme has been like this really interesting saga for specialized, um, for yeah. What year is it? 21. I think the first rhyme launched in 2012. Okay. Um, and so it's sort of, it's shifted and transitioned a little bit in its experience, but it's always kept some of that core DNA uh, that we've always had. So Rhyme, when it first came out, was like 2FO didn't exist, 510 existed, and they were like doing this new skate shoe thing that like no one understood. Mm-hmm. And then Rhyme came out and it was like kind of kind of an XC platform. It was like a very capable XC shoe was where it started. Okay. I was like V from rubber outsole. It had all this extra protection. It had a little bit of cushioning, but it's pretty XC still. Then Rhyme, we got rid of it. We we divested from Rhyme. We said Tufo huh. is the only is the only expression of trail that we want. And then we were we kind of started to realize like there's actually a big opportunity. There's like a lot of riders who go to a shop and they see Tufo and they're just like or or 510 or any of those like skate coastal style shoes. And they're like, this isn't for me. Like this is right. th- this, you know, like maybe I live in Crested Butte and I'm consistently riding over 12,000 feet. And like, it's weird to go into the back country in skate shoes, like, right. like a weird disconnect that you're like, this is, this doesn't make sense. But yeah, Ryan was gone. We didn't have Ryan. We just had 2FO and it just wasn't, so many people were just like, this, this isn't jive. This isn't, this isn't what I'm looking for. I, I'm looking for something that's like, like I have a little, I want to have a little more faith in it. I want to be able to like really have like this great off bike experience. And, and, um, uh, that's kind of when we started saying like, okay, we got, we got to figure something out. We act, we play with so many names on that thing too. Do we name it something new? Do we name it after something else? Uh, we had the Tahoe in the line at the time too. I friggin' hate to say okay. that name in reference to this shoe, but we had this other weird fitness shoe that kind of fell into this. So we were like, all right, let's clean this whole thing up. Rhyme is a that's that's the name. That's a that's about having like this outdoorsy capable shoe. Um, and that's uh, yeah. So so a couple of years ago, two maybe I think about two years ago we we launched. Uh, two clip versions of Rhyme, uh, so Rhyme 2.0 and Rhyme 1.0. Okay. And then uh, now we believe most of the opportunity then was in clip, and I think we realized how how wrong we were, how much huh. people want a good flat shoe that is this this aesthetic. Um, and so now we're, we're finally we got our act together and we made a flat shoe. Sweet. All right, Steve. Well, that's been amazing. Thanks heaps for all your help and and information on the on the new shoes cool yeah thanks 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 as well i think it's like yeah we, we i mean we spend our whole lives thinking about this like all day every day eat sleep make shoes so it's like there's um yeah there's so much from the team that goes into this that it's like it's really hard to have opportunities to share that share that stuff so it's yeah. I really appreciate like the opportunity to to do that to be like we think a shit ton about this. All, all <laughs> yeah, the time. these aren't just slapped together. Yeah. <laughs> cool.